Gamok bag. I made it as far as the HQ tent, but no farther that night. The storm dumped about four feet of snow on base camp. It was much worse on the ABC. Josh managed to get through on the radio only once during the night. It was scratchy and broken up, but we think that he said that they were sustained winds of 73 miles an hour and gusts of up over 100. The team members were hunkered down in their tents, but there was no way for Josh to check on them because of the weather. At first light, he dug out and reported in again. Base, we're all accounted for, but we have two cases of hate, Francis and Bill. One severe, one mild. How's the weather down there? Clear, the radio operator, Sparky answered. I just checked the meteorological maps, and there's nothing new coming in until tonight. When? Storm's ETA is 1900, give or take several hours. Josh gave a harsh laugh, followed by a coughing fit. When he finally recovered, he said, I hear you on that weather window. I'll start everyone down as soon as I can get them rehydrated. We're giving Bill extra O's, and he's responding well. I think he'll be able to make it down on his own. Lee and I will follow behind him with Francis and a couple Sherpas. We'll give Bill a hand if he needs it. We're trying to get Francis into a Gamoff bag. Francis was the guy who grunted at the noodles. A Gamoff bag, pronounced Gamoff, was invented by Igor Gamoff in the late 1980s and has saved a lot of climbers from dying of hate. It's like an airtight body bag. At high altitudes, air pressure is extremely low. You'll zip the victim inside a gamo bag, pull it up from the air until it's about the same pressure as it would be at sea level, and bingo. The climber can breathe again, hopefully. We'll start looking for the first climbers at about eight hours. Then, Sparky said, be careful coming down. Avalanche risk is high. Keep us posted on the weather. Roger. I dug my tent out of the snow and Zopa asked Sanjo and me to dig out Holly's tent, which took us hours. She didn't help us, but she kept us supplied with hot tea and cookies. Late that afternoon, the first of our team members started to straggle in, looking like zombies from Night of the Living Dead. It took them each three mugs of steaming sweet tea in the mess tent before they were finally able to put a coherent sentence together. It was a nightmare. The snow started a thousand feet below ABC. It was so thick we had to fix a rope and tie ourselves together so we didn't lose anyone. Couldn't see a bloody thing past our eyelashes. Then it really started snowing. 22 below at ABC without wind chill. We nearly froze to death trying to get our tents up. The guy talking gingerly pulled the glove off his right hand. Three fingers were discolored and blistered. Krieger says I'll keep the digits, but the little toe on my left foot is going to slough off in about a week. Never liked that toe anyway. He laughed, but it wasn't a merry sound. I'd show it to you, but it would just make you sick. The blizzard wasn't the worst of it, another climber said. Not by a far sight. He was a cowboy from Abilene, Texas. An avalanche hit us about two in the morning. Sounded like the biggest dang stampede you ever heard. Wiped out seven tents. Didn't lose a soul, thank the Lord, but we had to double and triple up in the remaining tents like sardines. Then the food ran out, the man with the frostbitten fingers said. Josh only had us bring enough for the trip and back. This morning, there wasn't a raisin to eat between us. We're lucky it cleared up. A couple more days, and we would have starved to death. You're right about that, partner, the Texan agreed. When I crawled out this morning, I was eyeing one of them yaks with Murder in my heart. Guess we should have had that dang puja ceremony before we started up that hill. Where's my... Where's Josh? I asked. Him and Krieger are still hauling Francis down, the Texan drawled. They didn't leave till late, from what I heard. Turns out Francis is claustrophobic. Should have guessed it. He's always sleeping with half his head outside the tent door. He about went plumb crazy when they zipped him into that bag. The only thing that saved him was that he passed out after a bit. You might be thinking that the above conversation was a little cold-hearted, and you'd be right. It was ten below zero outside, slightly warmer in the mess tent, but not much. When you're exhausted, having a hard time catching your breath, freezing, starving, 
waiting for your little toe to drop off, you have other things on your mind than the welfare of your fellow climbers. Zopa waved Sunjo and me over to him and told us to get our gear that we were going up the mountain to help Josh and Leah. J.R., Will, and Jack joined us. They had been filming our climbing lessons with Zopa for the last few days, and I wasn't sure they were coming with us or to get footage of the Gamoff bag in action. I didn't think a thousand feet would make that much of a difference, but at that altitude, even a hundred feet made a difference. Having to plow through freshly fallen snow didn't help. About every 20 steps I stopped, sucking in ragged breaths of freezing air. At this stage, my hope of getting to the summit, a mile and a half above where I was currently suffocating, seemed about as likely as me flying a Gamoff bag to Jupiter. My only consolation was that Sunjo and the film crew were having as much trouble as I was. The one person who wasn't affected was Zopa. He waved for us about 50 yards behind him, then continue up Rongbuk Glacier like a mountain goat breaking trail. By late afternoon, there was no sign of Josh or the others. If we didn't find them soon, we'd be searching in the dark. But even worse, clouds were starting to come in. Zopa let us catch up to him just as the sun started slipping behind the mountain. Maybe they're spending the night at Camp 2 or the Intermediate Camp, JR suggested between gasps. There are two camps on the way up to ABC, an Intermediate Camp and Camp 2, which lies three quarters of the way up to ABC. The intermediate camp was nowhere in sight, which meant that we weren't nearly as far up the mountain as it felt. And if they are not at the intermediate camp, or camp 2, and what if they're not at the intermediate camp, or camp 2, Zopa asked, meaning if Josh and Dr. Krieger had passed the camps, or hadn't reached them yet, they could freeze to death. Good point, J.R. concluded. What should we do? Zopa looked down at the glacier, then squinted up at the darkening sky. The storm is coming, he said. You can get down to base camp in an hour and a half, maybe two hours. If you leave now, you can beat it. JR gave him a skeptical look. We have been climbing for over four hours now. Downhill, Zopa said by a way of explanation. The trail is broken. Don't wander off it. Well, what about you? I asked. He pulled his headlamp out of his pack and strapped it around his parka hood then started to slip his pack back on. I know your father. You will not watch the men die. You will try to get them off the mountain. I think all of us wanted to go back down to base camp. I know I did, but none of us wanted to go down without Zopa, especially with bad weather coming in. We put our headlamps on and followed Zopa's light. Two hours later, in the dark, with the snow beginning to fall, we spotted two headlamps flickering a few hundred yards above us. Josh and Leah looked completely done in. I don't think they would have made it much farther on their own. And I don't know who was happier to see who. They were happy that we were there to help Francis get down. And we were happy to find them because it meant we got to go down. Did you bring O's? Josh asked, kind of slurring his words. Zopa pulled an oxygen tank and a mask out of his pack. Josh cranked up the regulator and handed it to Leah, who took several deep lungfuls. Josh was next. When he finished, he offered it to us, but we bravely shook our heads. We had been up long or as high as he and Leah, and the only reason they took hits was because they were exhausted. Climbers usually didn't start sucking O's until they got to Camp 5. Zopa pointed to the bag. How is he? Alive at least the last time we looked, but he has hate bad. Jar pointed his headlamp at the transparent window on the top of the bag, but it was too fogged up to see inside. You still with us, Francis? Josh shouted. I thought I heard a muffled reply, but it was hard to tell in the howling wind. He's writing a message, Leah said. We stared as a feeble backward say appeared in condensation on the window. Josh managed to laugh, then looked at Leah. Should we let him out? She shook her head. You're the doctor. He squatted and got closer to the bag. Help has arrived, Francis. We'll have you down to base camp soon. Soon turned out to be four more hours. The glacier was steep and icy. We had to place ice screws and lower the bag onto ropes a few feet at a time so 
we didn't take off like a toboggan. We stumbled into Bay's camp long after midnight. The camp was usually lit up like a Christmas tree with blue, red, and green tent lights, but this late, most of the climbers were asleep. We hauled the Gamoff bag into the aid tent and laid it on the cot. Leah pulled off her outer and inner thermal gloves with her teeth and then slowly unzipped the bag. How are you feeling? she asked. Francis was the color of a corpse. He blinked his eyes open and managed to give her a weak smile. He whispered, I'm not claustrophobic anymore. Leah smiled and put the stethoscope to his chest. But you still have hate. I'm not going to the summit? Not this year, Josh said, looking as disappointed as Francis. He had another opening on his climbing permit. We left Francis and Leah and went into the mess tent. A handful of the teens, staff, and Sherpas were still drinking up tea and playing cards. Josh reported on Francis's condition. When he finished, he asked how Bill was. Not too good, Texan answered. He doesn't want to go back up, Josh swore. Another climber down, and no one had climbed higher than ABC yet. The mess tent cleared out pretty fast after that, leaving me, Sunjo, Zopa, and Sparky. It felt good to drink hot tea and to breathe and have air actually fill my lungs. I felt like I was sitting in an oxygen tent, not a mess tent. Peek and Miss Angelo need to go up to the ABC, Sopa said. I know, Josh said. I was going to take them and the film crew up when I got back, but I'll have to wait a few days now. I'm white. I'll take them all up tomorrow, Sopa offered. I couldn't even imagine walking back up that glacier in a few hours, but I couldn't protest in front of Josh or Zopa. I wish that J.R., Will, and Jack hadn't headed to their tents after filming Francis being freed from the Ganoff bag. If they had been there to hear Zopa's suggestion, I'm sure they would have protested for me. I can't ask you to do that, Josh said. You didn't ask me, Zopa said. I offered. They need to go up. The weather will break in a few hours. Not according to the satellite maps I just looked at, Sparky said. Zopa shrugged. The maps are wrong. What about Holly? Josh asked. I had a doctor from the other camp look at her earlier today, Zopa answered. She can go. Josh grinned. So, you already had this figured out before you came up to get me. Zopa ignored the comment. We will take some of the porters and yaks, he said. Resupply what was lost in the storm. There are some Sherpas I would like to visit at the ABC before we leave the mountain. Did you talk to Passang? Passang was Josh's Sidar, who I'd seen around in the camp but had never officially met. He was constantly rushing about, yelling at the porters, arguing with the Sherpas, or in the HQ tent, talking to the base camp crew. He had the porters back what was needed this afternoon. Zopa answered. Josh looked at me. Are you ready for 21,000 feet? I said I was, but I had some serious doubts. I hope Zopa was wrong about the weather.